Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this Africa regional webinar on Special Economic Zones and the African Continental Free Trade Area. My name is Trudy Hartzenberg. I'm from the Trade Law Center Trullock, and it's my great honor to be moderating this session. Ladies and gentlemen, we have this webinar at a particularly important time. One week from today, we are completing phase one of the AFCFDA negotiations. We recall, of course, that the focus of the AFCFDA is not only on boosting intra-Africa trade, but very importantly, to leveraging the dynamic benefits of the free trade area to attract foreign direct investment, to support African countries to diversify and develop their productive capacity. This takes on special significance in the context of the current pandemic. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our two lead in um, contributions from Dr. S Dr. Samir Hamruni and Mr. Ahmed Beni from the AEZO and also from the Global um, Association of Free Trade Zones. Dr. Samir, over to you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Thank you, Ahmed, and thank you, Aizo, for the, this uh, invitation. As you know, I always like to add some personal elements to my observation, and I have a second one, which is related to this, um, this panel. The personal one is um, uh, our founding member, Tanjamet, in November 2015. Uh, invited my annual board of directors uh, and that date when seated with the first meeting of Africa Free Zone Organization at that time and today Africa Economic Zones Organization the job done in the last six years is immense and, uh, in order to say it in, in somehow humoristic way from a Delta organization Africa Economic Zone Organization today is a solid, mature sister organization. Thank you so much for the extremely well done uh, job. The second personal uh, information, I'm Arab African, I'm African Arab and I'm always have uh, put Africa in my, uh, in my uh, priorities. Coming to the topic, Africa Continental Free Trade Area, was uh, announced uh, months ago, uh, signed by 54 uh, countries and ratified by 36. A main objective of this uh, uh, agreement, it is to double the internal trade in Africa from the current 18% to the 36. This is a huge challenge and we need to speak about it and we need to see how we can, let's say, move and double this percentage, knowing that in other parts of the world, the European Union internal trade is 50%, and we don't speak about the internal one in the US, 70%. A lot of challenges, knowing that we are mainly small economies, fragmented economies, not really specialized when it comes to trade, and with a low rate of manufacturing. This is the first somehow challenges. How we will be able to reach this objective of doubling the internal trade in Africa. The second one, uh, several experience in several countries are showing that economic zones, free zones are contributing up to 25% of the local trade, like here in the international trade, like here I'm based in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, in Dominican Republic, in Latin America, the two thirds and in other countries, the average is extremely important. How can we make a much more, much higher contribution to the special economic zones, the African one, knowing that as per today, they are mentioned in the agreement, but then there is no more, no, there is not a lot of details about how special economic zones and how economic zones will be used within this agreement. Today, the second challenge we have, it is supposed to be the most advanced business infrastructure in every country 
how we can increase the contribution of the economic zones to this, uh, to doubling the percentage of intra-African trade. This is, uh, in my opinion, these are, in my opinion, the major two challenges that I hope today the, the speakers will help us to understand again. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you so much, African Economic Zones Organization, first of all, for the great job done till now and for this invitation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamruni. Ahmed, it's a great pleasure to hand over to you now for your opening remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Trudy, and uh, thank you, Dr. Samir, for this, uh, I would say, very warm welcome and uh, your contribution is highly appreciated to the debate of the day. I'm, uh, of course, very pleased to be here with you for the opening of this African session of the annual International Conference and Exhibition 2021. And uh, kindly allow me to express my thanks again to Dr. Samir and, of course, the World Free Zone Organization team for hosting this webinar, uh, that uh, making it successful. This webinar today is an entitled is entitled SEZ and Intra-African Trade, a path to economic diversification and inclusions. We are very happy uh, to, to, to get together a fine group of experts from the African Union Commission, from UNCTAD, from World Trade Organization, from UNECA, from uh, the OECD trade law centers, and of course, the ISO re representatives. Uh, a few words about our organization. So we are the representative of the African Economic Zones community. We belong also to the World Free Zone organizations and we are very, very close to each other. We are connecting today more than 82 economic zones across the continent and this represents 42 African uh, uh, countries. As of today, um, and uh, as per our Economic Zones Outlook 2021, there are about 203 operating economic zones in Africa and 73 projects have been announced for completions. More than 150,000 hectares of land has been dedicated to the implementation of the Economic Zones facilities across the continent, with more than 50% assigned to the agro-processing in Western Africa. But since, the, it's, since its inception, the African SEZ have given a significant boost to the FDI flows, creating an attractive investment conditions and supporting job creation. For the past five years, more than 60 million jobs have been created in agro-processing, industrial manufacturing and services. The economic zones are also one of the main devices to advance the objective of the CFTA in driving sustainable economic growth, uplifting trade integrations and enhancing the competitiveness and promoting the industrial investment and of course, uh, job creation across the continent. And the SEZ are, uh, could be accordingly be viewed as part of this strategic instrument that would accelerate the Africa's industrializations that will create employment and uh, lead to economic diversifications that will embrace everyone, the private sector, the public sectors, youth, uh, women, and many more. So SEZ today are playing an increasingly role in African industrial transformations, economic growth, and for the policymakers, institutional investors, uh, international financing institutions, it is crucial that economic zones performance is to be accelerated. The CFTA today, and the continental agreement with a market of 2.5 billion US dollars, and the forecast, forecast to boost uh, of 50% of the intra-African trade to reach close to 16 billion. And this covers several areas of interest to the economic zones operators, the duty-free treatment, the rules of origins, which is a major issue, customs corporations, trade facilitation, the trade, no, uh, the non-traffic barriers, the legal framework harmonizations and compliance with international standards. So when African SEZ, trade with themselves, they exchange more manufactured and processed goods, they support knowledge transfer and expertise sharing, and this would lead to create the complementarity and the diversifications of the continental va value chain. 
And indeed, the manufactured good makes up a, a much higher proportion of regional exports than those living in the continent. And the real test for the CFTA will be how quickly the African SEZ can, ex can accelerate the export diversifications and product sophistication and make trade more inclusive. Diversification should also lead to an increased sophistica sophistication of export product from coming from the African SEZ. And this refers to the product upgrading to productivity and increase of the overall value uh, uh, of export. So uh, a good demonstration is already met by some countries that have already established the SEZ program, such as Morocco, South, Afri South Africa, uh, Egypt, Nigeria, and others. But the, if the CFTA is to fulfill its, its potential in diversifying and transforming the African economies in inclusive manners, the African SEZ must develop an effective policies and strategy for export and identify new opportunities of diversifications, industrializations to build innovative regional value chain framework that would involve the high-end technology, higher quality input, to support trade facilitation reform and the, the CFTA. So the CFTA with the contribution of the SEZ can play a game changing role in Africa's economic diversification and inclusion. And this is definitely an opportunity not to be missed by the, the, the SEZ operator. So through efforts, resources, talent and knowledge sharing, we can affect change in accomplishing and developing special economic zones, as well as supporting the vision of creating one African market and uh, this African agreement. So for all African economic zones, this is definitely a window of time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, uh, for attending this webinar sessions, and I wish you a pleasant and informative debate. Thank you so much, Ahmed, and thank you very much to Dr. Samir and you for these opening remarks. This has been an important reminder, not only of the importance of this interconnection, the synergy between the SEZs and the AFCFDA, but also of the complexity of some of the governance issues, some of which are still to be negotiated. There's a lot of work to be done, and we look forward to hearing from our experts. Before we do turn to our eminent panel of experts, we're privileged to have a contribution from the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. His Excellency Wamkele Meni has recorded the following for our discussion today. Thank you so much, Farah, for sharing that with us. zones are uh, very important, particularly in the context of Africa, for a number of reasons. This is where industrialization happens. This is where innovation, research, and development happens. And this is where many, many African governments have invested uh, to make sure that there is job creation uh, in their countries. I have been to special economic zones in, uh, in Morocco, in Gabon, in South Africa in Egypt, and in all these countries, the contribution of special economic zones to a country's industrialization and to a country's ability to connect to uh, global value chains is remarkable. And I, I will give you an example. We now have in Gabon, in the special economic zone, uh, we have a generic drug uh, manufacturing capacity. Gabon has introduced, um, uh, uh, int uh, has uh, in in invited uh, uh, companies that produce generic drugs that are exported to the region. This makes sure that there's affordability of public health, that public health is serviced by uh, access to uh, affordable uh, medication. In Morocco, what I saw is that 20 years ago, the special economic zone in Tangen had started with textiles and clothing and now has advanced in the value chain um, to very, very sophisticated value added production in the area of um, uh, aircraft supplying to Airbus and Boeing. And the, the contribution of these special economic zones 
to a country and the region's industrial capacity and industrial development um, is, as I say, truly remarkable. And so the African continental free trade area, in my view, has to nurture that and has to make sure that we leverage on the uh, special economic zones. There has to be better interconnectivity and there has to be a very, very clear path of establishment of value chains that will uh, be enabled by the African continental free trade area so that these goods uh, contribute to and the services provided there and the innovation that happens in the special economic zones is a contribution to objectives of, um, of the African continental free trade area, or for that matter, any free trade zone. I think the challenges that uh, have been identified about uh, goods produced in special economic zones and the idea that these goods cause uh, market distortion once they cross the border into the normal market, we have, there are solutions to those challenges. There are practical solutions to those challenges. Um, and in the, next, in the next few months, we will ta start taking concrete steps to address these challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, on your behalf, we're very grateful to the Secretary General for the important reminder about what the SEZs can contribute in synergy with leveraging the relationships and the connections between this continental free trade area and the special economic zones. He's mentioned contributions already across a range of very important sectors. He's mentioned also value chain connections strengthening our resilience in terms of developing not only national productive capacity, but regional productive capacity. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now time for us to move to our eminent panel of experts. Before we do that, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who have joined us from across the globe, and in particular from so many African countries this morning, we look forward to your active participation. And you may do that via the chat room function so Samira, Farah and I will be watching what comes through on the chat room and we will direct your questions and contributions to the panelists. It's now important for us to introduce our panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, we do face some time constraints. Our panelists will each speak for 10 minutes initially, after which we will open for discussion and we will then consider your contributions as well. It's a great pleasure to invite our first speaker this morning, Amelia Santos Paulina. She's the Chief of the Investment Issues and Analysis Section at UNCTAD. And she's particularly focusing on a number of important contributions that come from UNCTAD hot off the press as we speak. The launch of the World Investment Report earlier this week, ladies and gentlemen, contains important information for us to consider in this discussion. She will also be looking at issues related to a survey taking a look at the relationship between SEZs and the AFCFDA. And she's going to speak to us about the increasingly competitive and to some extent unpredictable environment in which we operate, of course, exacerbated by the global pandemic. How can SEZs maximize the development outcome in countries and the regions in which they operate? Amelia, it's a great pleasure to hand over to you. You have 10 minutes for your initial contribution. Many thanks, Trudy, and many thanks to the World uh, Free Zones Organization and to the Africa Economic Zones Organization, uh, a body that represents an important, uh, an important uh, stakeholder and an important partner for uh, for UNCTAD. And today I will be discussing some of the findings that we put together in a in the form of a report based on the survey as as you mentioned Trudy but I will uh, I will not expand on this because I am limited on time and I think is a our world investment report came at the best of time just in time for this conference because we cannot analyze the trade and diversification landscape if we don't understand what is happening with investment so we have some headlines that are not very, very positive because we see that global investment flows 
plunged globally by 35% in 2020 as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. And even though the, the shock impacted different regions at different degrees, and especially if we see this graph, developed economies, the decline was larger, but in developing countries, especially in uh, African countries, the impact was mostly felt in sectors that are important for productive capacity and for the development uh, prospects of the continent. So basically, I mean, we have not seen this level of impact since the aftermath of the global financial crisis in 2019. Having said that, uh, we present in the report some analysis showing that FDI is gaining some lost ground, although the prospects for developing countries is cautionally, we have to be cautioned uh, to, with the, when analyzing the prospects, because as long as the rollout of vaccines and the investment packages for the recovery post pandemic are not realized across developing countries, the prospect for, uh, for a recovery are very, are very limited. So basically, before going into the into the topic of today, I just wanted to give you a, a quick snapshot of what happened in Africa. Um, here I am showing you the top five recipients of foreign direct investment uh, in the region, and Egypt remains the top recipient, even though it observed uh, a decline uh, in relation to the to the previous year. So in general, uh, the flows of foreign direct investment to the continent fell by 16% to 14 billion. And this decline was last seen 15 years ago, which is a major uh, issue for concern. But what really matters here, as I said, in the report, we look at different types of investment, uh, both those that uh, reflect the financial component of foreign investment, but also greenfield investment and greenfield project announcement, which are key for the industrial industrialization prospect of the region. So the greenfield investment to Africa, this, those project announcements fell by 62%, which is a major setback for the productive capacity development, as I said. Our forecasting model, uh, as I said, has some positive outlook for uh, 2021, but is for a marginal increase of foreign direct investment to the region. Um, a piece of good news in this, uh, in this context, despite the shock uh, to commodities and the low oil prices, when you look at the investment policy part of the story, there are some positive developments. We see that uh, the pandemic has prompted some countries to encourage domestic as well as, as well foreign investment in the health sector. So this is a piece of good news, but the problem is that as a, with the manufacturing sector, this happens at a different degrees of success and speed. So uh, we see that worldwide around 22 countries have managed to establish special economic zones targeting specifically the health sector, which is uh, not only the development of uh, of medicines, but also health services in general. But in Africa, this uh, trend is very limited and there are exceptions like Ethiopia. So in the whole negative shock and negative outlook, there is some signs of positive recovery. And we hope that it only will not be in the, in the oil sectors and, all, uh, and in the resource uh, based manufacturing sector, but also that the SEC development could spill over to, to the health sector as well. So um, in terms of opportunities and, and challenges, uh, we look at the report at many, many aspects of investment related policies, especially investment in sustainable recovery. The report is global, it's not SEC oriented, but later on I will come back to the policy aspect. But what is important here is to go back, take a step back and see what is the sentiment of, as you said, of uh, developers of firms in as you said, across the region. So here I would like to share with you some of the findings in the context of the implementation of the AFCFTA, 
that come from the survey that we developed and uh, launched last December with the Africa Economic Zones Organization. So basically we sent to around 100 potential respondents the, the survey and we receive a very positive rate of response, trying to look at what are the different aspects, not only in relation to trade, because trade uh, integration is a very well analyzed topic. And I'm glad that there are other colleagues that will uh, discuss that today here, like Andrew Mould and Mubaralok and, and the colleagues from WTO. But here we wanted to zoom in into what are the prospects for investment and investment attraction. So uh, one key issue that we try to, to be analyze in detail, what are the challenges and opportunities that, uh, that the, the, the zones perceived uh, in, the, in the continent. So we try to look at the investment patterns and social and environmental practices challenges faced specifically by African, as you said, that are different from those in Latin America, Asia, and so on. And what is the future of, as you said, in the, in the wake of the AFCFTA? So basically opportunities, the majority of respondents coincided to say that enhanced industrial diversification is key. And this, are, this is the main opportunity for the continental free trade area. There are also high expectations in terms of bilateral cooperation and attracting new investment. So these are the opportunities and, uh, and they are in line with the opportunities for enhancing trade as well. So uh, as we know, foreign direct investment is the other side of the coin of trade relations. But then there are challenges and this relates specifically to the issues of neglect of labor and social standards as well as environmental standards and also by the divergence between uh, firms and market sizes in the region. Um, this issue of uh, social and environmental standard is very important. And later on, I will come back to the concept that we have developed at UNTAD of what we call SDG model zones, zones that not only exploit or try to maximize the development gains of higher trade and higher market access, but also response to these challenges that are identified not only by the policy and academic community, but also by the SSS themselves. So basically, in general, the, the, the survey shows that it is very likely that the, the continental free trade area will result in greater ability to attract FDI flows as the value proposition of many special economic zones improve. So this is a, a positive, on average, despite uh, challenges, this is a positive outlook. Then what are the sectors? I mean, uh, uh, in the, the keynote speakers, uh, all highlighted the issue of diversification, product upgrading, and, and, and industrial upgrading. Uh, in the survey, what we perceived was that despite the positive, positive outlook for higher GBC intensive activities in the region, still agriculture and food processing and resource-based manufacturing remain the most important sectors for, as I said, in the region. Um, here, there is a long list of issues that we could go into, into what is the backward and forward linkages and uh, the prospect for more intra-regional cooperation so as to upgrade along the value chain. But unfortunately, we don't have time to go into, into that. But the good news is that after this primary sector, there is a post a implementation of the continental free trade area, there is expectations for GBC industries like automotives, uh, textile, manufacturing, electronics, and so on to grow as well. So this is more or less the, the outlook that, that, uh, that we uh, present in the, in, the, um, in the survey. So, but we try to also look what are the, the factors that might promote prompt investment attraction into uh, the special economic zones um, in Africa. So basically uh, here I can say that the expectations for foreign direct investment are on par with expectations with trade and basically reflect the, the pattern of intra and extra Africa trade. So basically the majority of respondents of the, of the survey expect uh, that FDI will increase, but mostly will be from outside Africa. It will be mostly from 
traditional partners outside uh, the, the country. Of course, I mean, when you enter into this type of continent-wide um, negotiations, it is uh, the expectations are this will bring more investment, more resources. And for this, I think it's important the, the proper completion of the investment chapter of the, of the agreements so as to, to rip off these benefits that uh, some managers, developers, investors are expecting. As I said, I mean, the, the outlook is likely to remain the same if you compare the actual investors and the expected the expectations for future investment. So basically, currently, we have that over 40% of FDI into the continent comes into special economic zones come from China and then followed by India and France at that equal footage and then Spain and so on. Most of these reflect existing trade arrangements as well. But post-Africa, the picture is not likely to change much at the top, but there is expectation that other developing countries and other intra-regional partners will play a, a greater role like South Africa, Egypt, um, Ethiopia, and, and so on. And uh, so this is in terms of, uh, of partners and the prospect, as I mentioned before, for investment into industries is very similar as the prospect for what exports will grow after the implementation of the agreement. So again, here we see the predominance of the agriculture and food sector and resource based on like manufacturing. But again, other manufacturing, textile, electronics, and so on have a very uh, high, um, will appear some of the most important industries to grow after the implementation of the agreement in terms of FDI attraction. So for this, we need to go back and uh, we always, when, uh, and this is not only in this survey, but also in the World Investment Report, every trend we analyze, we try to match it to the, not only with the theory, but what will be the policy steps needed to, to address the, the, the challenges and to maximize the, the chances for benefiting and to, and to realize the opportunities. So here, uh, before going into, into analysis uh, per se and to policy recommendations, we ask uh, what are the long structural barriers faced by the zones in the region that, have, that prevent to create what we call a level playing field? What are the factors that are considered most important or extremely important that could hinder trace from uh, trace zones development? And here basically, uh, as you can see, it, it relates to barriers, informal barriers uh, above all, and also non-tariff barriers, as Mr. Amben is mentioned, these issues that of behind the border measures and uh, over and above infrastructure development and what are what is the other uh, information asymmetries are important to to be addressed in order to maximize the benefits for SSS. So here there is uh, some, some factors that we, that we mentioned in order to, to address the issue of leveling the playing field and it's harmonization of fiscal incentives across countries, harmonization of behind the border measures and addressing especially the issue of non-tariff barriers, rules of origins as Mr. Bennett mentioned. And also the, uh, an issue that came across very strongly was the temporary exemptions for country specific circumstances. How to handle this in the context of the agreement. I think these are important to, to prevent pure waste competition among, as you said, and facilitate positive externalities. And uh, of course, the, the goal to achieve is to uh, is, uh, industrial upgrading. So moving on, because I know that my time is limited. Um, basically, since 2019, when we published the World Investment Report focusing on a spe special economic zone, and, uh, an issue is that economic gains will not be automatic. And we know that since the countries started way back in the 70s, 80s with the, with the models of uh, bringing special zones, processing zones to the, to the countries, industrial park, whatever taxonomy we, 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 we use to describe the, the model of special economic zones. So this, um, after WIR 2019, World Investment Report 
2019, we continue working with partners like uh, the Association of uh, Economics, Special Economic Zones in Africa, and with donors. And um, in addition to the to the survey that we published last December, we are developing a handbook focusing on the implementation of the a, the African Continental Free Trade Area and the future of a special economic zones. So here we, in addition to doing all the necessary qualitative and quantitative analysis, we try to put forward policy recommendations that are useful not only for the private sector, but for the public sector as well. And uh, some of us here in the panel have commented on the report. We are very grateful for that. And we have some set of um, what is required in terms of policy action to fully exploit the, the potential of a special economic zones. So basically, countries have to uh, countries have to play to their strength. So countries need to to find to to focus. Uh, on the importance of a well-targeted strategic uh, focus on SZ. So countries have to use the, the all discussion on strength and comparative advantages. Then the second recommendation is that we have to unite the team. Uh, here there is a crucial role for investment promotion and integrated policies and institutional collaboration across different ministries. It's the same story that we say when we discuss mainstreaming trade into national development strategies. So here you have to unite the whole policy and private sector team. The other recommendation is know your place. And as you said, design tailored to local context is very important. And this is where regional associations and global associations play an important role. Uh, tap into outside experience, international partnership, again, and in the regional context will become more important and in the context of global organizations like the World Free Zones Organization. And also peer learning, and this is something that we try to do with the handbook, is to bring experience not only from Africa, but from other regions. So there could be peer learning and sharing of lessons learned. And given the challenges that the sons themselves have expressed, and we as an analyst and as a policymakers and practitioners have identified, be green and social and is, is, is crucial. E economic, social, and um, governance standards are very important to, in the context of increasing the social impact of SEC as a competitive factor. And then get, get the full benefits, reaping dynamic gains, of, as you said, that is very is linked to the factors above. Uh, I've been told that I'm out of time, but before I finish, I just want to leave you with the, the, my, last, um, my last note is that this year in the World Investment Report, as I said at the beginning, we focus on investment in sustainable recovery and investment in productive capacities, in addition to looking at the impact on investment on SDGs related sector. So we put forward a policy framework that is an upgraded version of other frameworks that we have presented before in the context of the SDGs with a specific role for a, a special economic zones. Um, what we call sustainable development zones could play a catalytic role to make sustainable development impact a locational advantage for zones. And this is an important message because, as I said, comes from the zones themselves. You need to make uh, this social and environmental a locational advantage of the zones in order to be competitive at the global level. And also it will help to attract investment into SDG related activities. Uh, this comes hand in hand with promoting investment in resilience, balancing a stimulus between infrastructure and industry, and addressing the implementation and challenges that uh, recovery plans have for a coherent policy approach. We know that not all the countries have the same fiscal space to, to promote this recovery plan. This is why uh, sectors such as uh, productive sectors, such as special economic zones, are all the most more important in this context. I will stop here and I hope I didn't, I didn't pass my time uh, allocated. 
Thank you so much, Trudy. And uh, I, I look forward to the discussion. Finally, just let me say that we are having the World Investment Forum in October, and we have a set of events dedicated to special economic zones. And I look forward to coordinating with you all in order to have your presence at the forum. We will have more than six events dedicated to special economic zones, with two dedicated to Africa. And I look forward to continue the discussion. Thank you very much. Amelia, thank you so much for that very interesting, important and comprehensive discussion. We note a number of very important points, of course, that you've raised. The importance not only of intra-Africa FDI, but also global FDI. We've seen significant interest already from global sources in the AFC FDI and the potential that it offers in terms of integrating markets, breaking down those tariff and non-tariff barriers. And so really important issues for SEZ mobilization at the national level and see what countries will do in terms of developing their strategies to attract FDI. We also note some of the concerns that have been raised, some of the impediments related to those important challenges that are regulatory focused, focused on standards and the fragmentation of the African continent. So these are all extremely important for us to keep in mind. Your reference to the World Investment Report, very sobering. However, it is important that we build in order to attract the foreign direct investment, in particular, of course, for greenfield investment to diversify and build new capacity for production across all sectors of the African economy. Thanks so much again, Amelia, for that. Thank you so much for having me. We now turn to Willie Shumba. Willie joins us this morning, ladies and gentlemen, from the African Union Commission. Willie is an expert on international trade, customs and trade facilitation matters. And Willie will provide us with an update on the AFCFTA negotiations and implementation processes. Willie, I've just noticed that in fact, we now have 37 state parties with the latest deposit of that instrument of ratification by Algeria. So we are making great progress. And of course, we're watching what happens in the negotiations as we head for the deadline next week for phase one, trade and goods, outstanding issues, tariff concessions, rules of origin, and for trade and services, those sector commitments that still have to be negotiated. Willie, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. You have 10 minutes for your contribution. Thank you very much, uh, Trudy. Uh, basically, uh, uh, let me say welcome to listeners. My presentation is in two parts. The first part is an update on the AFCFTA. And the second part will be uh, how the AFCFTA will benefit, uh, how the AFCFTA will benefit uh, the SEZ and how the SEZ Will benefit. Uh, uh, will benefit uh, uh, the AFCFTA. I think there is a mutual beneficial uh, relationship there. So basically, coming on to the update, I'm just giving you an update so that we are fully aware of what has happened uh, recently. Uh, the starting point is we are fully aware that 54 countries have signed the agreement. There hasn't been any change to that. There are still 54 countries and Eritrea is uh, the one country which has not yet signed, uh, which has not yet signed the agreement. And secondly, 37 countries have deposited their instruments of ratification. Algeria has recently submitted. So there are 37 state parties and this is a very this is a very big achievement, considering that the AFCFTA entered into force uh, in uh, May 2019, and we can see a lot of countries uh, depositing their instruments of ratification. And I need to mention that apart from Algeria, there are also quite a number of countries who are in the process of uh, processing their ratification processes in order to submit. You know, ratification procedures uh, vary from country to country. 
depending on national legislation and the national constitution constitutions. But there are strong indications that a number of countries uh, are moving in uh, to make sure that they have deposited their instruments of ratification. Uh, the second most important, or rather the uh, second item that I want to update you on is the negotiations on the rules of origin. These have been ongoing. Uh, the negotiations are ongoing. Even as we talk right now, there are meetings which are considering the rules of origin. But what I need to inform you is there has been a strides made, specific, uh, quite great strides made on the rules of origin. Right now, 86% of the rules of origin have been concluded. And amongst the outstanding, amongst the outstanding assignments on rules of origin, we have areas such as your edible oils, the automotive industry, the textile, the textile industry. These are some of the areas which are outstanding uh, when it comes to rules of origin. Then uh, there is work going on on tariff offers. A, a number of countries have submitted their tariff offers, but these offers are in the process of being uh, verified. As we are fully aware, uh, under the AFCFTA, 90% of the tariff lines are, uh, are supposed to be offered duty-free. So we do have quite a number of countries who have submitted their tariff offers, and these are in the process uh, of being verified. The same also applies to services. There is work ongoing on services to make sure that the offers on the services uh, 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 are, also, are also processed. Then uh, coming on to trading documents, uh, a lot of work has been done on trading documents. Uh, basically, the mandatory trading documents have been identified. These mandatory trading documents uh, is the certificate of origin, uh, the certificate of origin, then uh, the manufacturers and the producers' declarations. These documents are mandatory documents. But for trade in the AFCFTA, for trade in the AFCFTA, uh, for trade in the AFCFTA, uh, uh, each country will, uh, will have, will maintain their own uh, declaration documents, etc. But the mandatory trading documents uh, have been identified, and these are three in number. Uh, thank you, Farah, for sharing the screen. Then uh, negotiations on phase two are underway. This is an investment competition policy and intellectual property rights. Uh, the meetings have started and there are negotiations underway. Then uh, there are also quite a lot of uh, awareness and capacity building exercises underway in, uh, in, AU, uh, in AU member states and state parties. And at the same time, national implementation strategies, uh, member states, state parties are being assisted to establish the national implementation strategies and committees because these are the structures which will make sure that at national level, at national level, work is, uh, is done. Now I move on to my next slide. Uh, I, I move on to my next slide. And my next slide deals with the benefits uh, of the AFCFTA to SEZ and also the benefits of the special economic zones to uh, the African continent of free trade area. And in doing that, I can't avoid referring to you to article 23 of the protocol on trade in goods. And this article specifically deals with special economic zones. And I would want you to know the three paragraphs there in Article 23. I have done my own italics to underscore, to highlight the importance of this. I think these three, this article, the three paragraphs, they summarize the importance of special economic zones to the AFCFTA. 
and also the importance of the AFCFTA to the special economic zones. In one, it says, state parties may support the establishment and operation of special economic uh, arrangements for special economic zones for the purposes of accelerating development. You can see how important it is. It is realized that special economic zones are a tool for accelerating, uh, for accelerating uh, uh, economic development. So that's, very, that's a very important message which is coming in the protocol that state parties uh, may support the establishment and operation of these special economic zones. So if you are in that industry of special economic zones, be assured that the AFCFTA agreement recognizes the importance of supporting SEZ and the fact that they will be a useful tool, uh, they are a useful tool uh, in accelerating development. Then the second paragraph again, which is also very important, talks of products benefiting from the SEZ arrangement shall be subject to any regulations and shall be developed by the, any regulations that shall be developed by the Council of Ministers uh, under this paragraph uh, shall be in support of the Continental Industrialization Program. Now, what is important is the fact that special economic zones are recognized as supporting the continental industrialization programs. So what you see there is industrialization, continental industrialization recognizes that special economic zones are a tool for this. Then uh, the next element is the fact that uh, goods manufactured in special economic zones shall be subject to the provisions uh, of the AFCFTA rules of origin. Then to my next slide, uh, to my next slide, I think I have already highlighted those things of how special economic zones are important to the AFCFTA. But at the same time, I want to underscore that the SEZs as well are very important to the African continental free trade area in the fact that they shall be a source of supply of goods to the AFCFTA. And remember, I have highlighted that accelerating economic development and industrialization. And this means SEZ shall be a source of supply of goods to the AFCFTA. They are a tool to accelerate development. They support industrialization and your value chains in industrialization and in manufacturing of product. SEZ will have a role to play. And of course, when you talk of SEZ, you are talking of the investment issues, the job creation issues, and the economic activity issues. But what we need to note is, uh, you will have noticed from Article 23 that there are supposed to be regulations for SEZ which are supposed to be developed. And this is one of the outstanding work which has to be done under the AFCFTA, developing regulations for SEZ. And the fact that goods manufactured, goods produced from SEZ are bound by the rules of origin of the AFCFTA. So I hope with this, we have managed to appreciate the role, the benefits of SEZ to the AFCFTA, and also how the AFCFTA is also expecting to reap benefits out of SEZ. And the fact that a lot of work has taken place uh, under the AFCFTA to date. I thank you very much. If you want, you have got, we've got a website which you can visit to update yourself on the work taking place under the AFCFTA. Thank you very much. Willie, thank you so much for that contribution, for the update on the AFCFTA negotiations and ratification, but also your reminder of the importance that the SEZs are in fact provided for in the legal instruments of the African continental free trade area. So the provisions of Article 23 of the Protocol on Trade and Goods, extremely important, and then the rules of origin. 
And this provides a very important segue to introduce our next speaker this morning, Andrew Mould. Andrew is the Chief of the Cluster for Regional Integration for the Office of Eastern Africa, falls under the Economic Commission of Africa. Andrew, it's a great pleasure to welcome you this morning. And um, Willie's reference to rules of origin, often the fine print in an agreement which can have a very important impact on whether the trade preferences are taken up or not. But what I'd like to ask you is to cast your scope a little bit more broadly and to reflect of the, on the important opportunities that the AFCFDA offers for SEZ development and linking that to the imperative in, of industrialization as we've also heard from Willie. But equally, let's turn it around and take a look at the SEZ contribution to achieving the objectives of the African continental free trade area. Thank you so much, Andrew. You have 10 minutes to. Thank you very much, Trudy. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, it was interesting listening to the earlier interventions there. Um, my remarks are going to be um, rather spontaneous, not, not so well structured as my previous uh, colleagues' uh, remarks. I did have a few slides to illustrate my uh, arguments, but I think possibly it's better just to talk to the subject. Um, now, Willie's already addressed some of these issues related to how export processing zones and special economic zones fit into the AFCFTA. Um, I think it's important to realize that the AFCFTA really means a fundamental change of strategic emphasis for the continent. Um, over the last 60 years, really, since independence, most countries have generally targeted their diversification strategies on high-income country markets under preferential market access schemes. And we know with, with a few exceptions, that generally hasn't been successful in terms of delivering the kind of economic diversification and structural change that the continent would like to see. So I think it's very timely that with the continental free trade area, there's the possibility of a new approach. Um, there's some particular weaknesses in export processing zones being focused almost exclusively on high income country markets. Um, that's partly because uh, preferential market access is given on the one hand, but can quite quickly be taken away again. So we've had struggles in East Africa, for example, um, back in 2008, uh, Mozambique was uh, suspended from AGOA, and that caused considerable problems for the exporters in the textile sector there. Um, you see problems also, for example, Randers recently also had some problems with uh, a temporary suspension from AGOA. Um, countries have also struggled in terms of meeting some of the uh, cytosanitary requirements under these agreements and the rules of origin. So in reality, we haven't really seen as fast a diversification as we would like. And I would suggest that for, from a strategic point of view, I think for export processing zones, it's a moment to reconsider that emphasis on external continental markets and look, for the, look at the continental approach more closely for a number of reasons. Firstly, over the last two decades, we actually see South-South trade has been growing very rapidly uh, globally. Um, it's gone up from around 25% to over 40% of global trade is now South-South trade in the last two decades. And within the continent, as in a recent piece I published for Brookings, I think there's an underappreciation of the real scale of intra-African trade as it stands, even before the AFCFTA has been uh, implemented. Uh, we point in that article to the fact that firstly, cross-border informal trade is very high on the continent uh, and could boost uh, intra-African trade figures by high figures by as much as 40%. Uh, but also because a number of countries are very heavily commodity export dependent, that distorts our views of the relative importance of intra-African trade. And finally, some of the largest economies in, in, on the continent, uh, Egypt, Nigeria, and to a lesser degree, South Africa, have less been, been less focused on the African market than some of the smaller economies, which are much more highly dependent, both from the point of view of exports and imports on the African continent. So I think given that context, and the fact that prospects for high-income country growth in those markets is relatively constrained, 
I think the way to accelerate uh, economic diversification is clearly the continental route. Um, there was a very important contribution to the literature um, back in 2003 um, by Hummels and Klenner that made the observation that growth in trade doesn't tend to happen by exporting more of what you already possess in terms of your comparative advantages, but rather by diversifying into new products. According to their calculation, 60% of global trade growth is, is through what they call the extensive margin. So you move into new product development areas. And I think that's where the AFCFTA really offers a lot more prospects for African countries in terms of accelerating that diversification into new products. I recently did some computations actually on the rate of growth of both intra and extra African manufactured exports and found that while there'd been over the last two decades a doubling of extra African manufactured exports uh, to the rest of the world, the intra African manufactured exports had actually gone up by a factor of five. So much more, far, uh, much faster growth of the intra-African manufactured goods. And that again brings home this point, about, I think about the certain reorientation of uh, strategy and the focus of export processing zones. Um, a final point I'd like to make about you know, the relative strengths of focusing on the African market is the AFCFTA is not a preferential agreement. It's, it's, it's a binding agreement and it's reciprocal market access. And I think one of the things that's handicapped a lot of development of export processing zones across the continent has actually been this uh, lack of reliability in the market access that's provided under some of these schemes. And so the AFCFTA is a much safer um, framework for, for approaching uh, the growth of exports. Now, one of the problems I can see that may come up, which uh, Willie alluded to in his presentation, was um, the need to comply with the rules of origin and to have a special regime there for, for export uh, processing zones. Um, because of course, clearly part of their benefit derives from the fact that they can import duty-free uh, on, on condition that those goods are exported, uh, subsequently re-exported uh, after value addition. Now, within the AFCFTA, it's important that the export processing zones don't become conduits for transshipment of goods from outside the continent. So I think this is a, an area of uh, particular importance in terms of the, the, the legislative framework in which the EPZs are gonna be operating. Um, and I think I'd like to just make one final point there about the strategic reorientation. Uh, Amelia talked about the trends in FDI, which was very interesting. And uh, I think from the survey data, she was suggesting that um, extra African FDI was going to increase more than intra African FDI. Now, I'm a strong believer that you know, the, the way to accelerate the progress towards this doubling. Uh, of uh, intra-African trade that Dr. Samir uh, mentioned in his opening remarks is through FDI. Uh, there's a lot of talk currently about cross-border trade and you know, uh, small traders in formal sector. That's all important, but in actual fact, we know that global trade is, tends to be dominated by multinational companies and around two thirds of global trade is, is uh, under the control of multinational corporations and around half of that is intra-firm trade. So FDI has a very important role to play in terms of the integration of the African continent and increasing those levels of intra-African trade. Now, I do believe that investors from outside the continent have a very important role to play just as they did in Europe they helped anticipate, American firms, for example, helped anticipate uh, the measures implemented under the single market program in the European Union to help the integration of uh, activities across border within Europe. And I can see a similar positive role for, for um, multinational corporations from outside the continent with the AFCFTA. But I think it's important to emphasize that, you know, ideally we'd like to see a lot more intra-African FDI. And there the trends have not been particularly 
uh, encouraging recently in Eastern Africa, for example, we've seen quite uh, stagnant flows of intra-regional FDI. The reason is, you know, the, the, the minute that you have uh, companies um, with affiliates under common ownership operating across borders, they will automatically increase uh, their trade in, in cross-border cross services and goods between their affiliates and their, their headquarters. And so that very much uh, increases the prospects for, for intra-African trade. Um, so I think with those comments, um, I think I'll leave it there and just see what the uh, discussion is going to be subsequently, Trudy. Um, but those were the things I would stress, you know, the, 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 the broader strategic story about, you know, what is the focus markets for export growth in the future and uh, what we can do in terms of incentivizing further intra-African investment. Thank you. Andrew, thank you so much for that. A reminder, of course, that there is perhaps far more intra-regional trade and investment on the continent that, than our official statistics indicate. So just as we have informal cross-border trade, we also have smaller scale flows of investment across borders um, as sole proprietors set up businesses and so on. So there's a great deal that we can do to improve our understanding of what is actually happening on the continent. I think your point about the resilience of manufactured exports on the continent is extremely important. This is, of course, so relevant to our discussion about SEZ development and expanding and diversifying our industrial capacity. The issue about global FDI coming onto the continent, of course, very important because as global investors establish commercial presence, they will get access to the benefits of the AFC FDA if they are located in a state party. So they are really interesting issues. And then the regulatory issues, highlighting again the rules of origin. This is one of the essential minimum requirements for a free trade area. And this is often where the detail is so important to study. As Willie has indicated, we've made significant progress, but it's often in those last few product categories that there are also opportunities for increasing and attracting foreign direct investment to increase our trade and our productive capacity. So we have to watch those negotiations. Thank you for raising that again. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my great pleasure to invite Mena Hassan. Dr. Mena Hassan is from the World Trade Organization. She joins us this morning from Geneva. Mena, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Mena is a trade facilitation expert. Of course, now she's also working on accessions and playing a very important role to expanding the membership of the WTO, which of course includes a number of African countries which are in that process. Mina, we'd like you to share with us some thoughts on the importance of trade facilitation measures in the effective and the proper, the well-governed functioning of special economic zones. Which measures are particularly important for us to pay attention to? And what will we see in terms of the implementation, not only of the trade facilitation measures under the AFC FDA, but of course, WTO trade facilitation agreement as well. Thank you so much. You have 10 minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Trudy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you very much uh, to the African Economic Zones Organization uh, for having invited me today uh, to speak on this uh, very important topic. And of course, for uh, the distinguished pan panel panelists and, and um, uh, our distinguished moderator, uh, Trudy. Um, of course, as an African, um, whenever there's any discussion or debate that talks about, um, that, that helps to, to evolve uh, Africa's economic uh, uh, development and uh, regional integration, uh, that's something that I very much uh, enjoy to be a part of. Um, now, as you all know, I think, um, you know, trade facilitation is an area which uh, regulates behind the border uh, measures. Uh, really those which aim to lower transaction costs or, or trade costs. Those are really the hidden costs, uh, such as red tape, cumbersome customs procedures, uh, excessive fees, uh, formalities, et cetera. 
Um, so the real uh, objective of trade facilitation is uh, the simplification, modernization, and harmonization of import and export uh, procedures. Now, if we bring this to Africa, um, I think you know today we're we're kind of aware of the fact that uh, it's still quite common uh, to see a lot of bureaucratic delays, red tape, uh, and, and inefficiencies, especially at an African borders. Um, and the same does apply for many uh, uh, SEZs. Uh, now, these impediments increase the cost, uh, cost and time of doing business for traders across the continent, and thereby uh, really inhibiting um, the objective of intra and inter-regional uh, trade. Now, in the case of uh, special economic zones, um, on average, customs clearance, clearance times are higher uh, in African countries than any uh, than most other parts in the world, uh, but in some cases, even customs clearance uh, is found to be higher in special economic zones uh, than outside the special economic zones in some African countries. Um, now, according to the UNECA, uh, which projects that with enhanced trade facilitation. Uh, the, AFC, the AFCFTA uh, would increase intra-African trade by around 20% of total, total trade for Africa by 2022. Uh, and this in turn can potentially reduce trade costs by around 14%. Um, now, moreover, trade facilitation reforms are really crucial to Africa's economic diversification efforts, integration into regional and global value chains, but also to promote uh, investment. And uh, SEZs are established as a stepping stone to reach those same goals. Now, against this background, we can then move on to the legal framework of on, on trade facilitation. And here uh, we have really two main ones. Uh, the first relates to the WTO's uh, trade facilitation agreement. And then the second would be uh, on trade facilitation in the African continental free trade area. So in the WTO, the, the TFA, uh, which entered into force in 2017, um, has now 41 out of the 44 African WTO members, uh, they have ratified the TFA. We have three African countries missing, that's the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Guinea-Bissau, and Mauritania. Now, the TFA comprises three broad areas um, um, uh, of, of which exist 36 different measures. But those three broad areas um, include, the, well, the first is, is transparency-related measures. I mean, many of us, when we think of trade facilitation, we usually think of uh, uh, customs uh, as that first comes to mind. But, um, but transparency, the availability of information, uh, for traders, uh, that is, is very key, is a key component of facilitating trade. Um, a second key component uh, is uh, related to customs procedures, which help uh, to expedite the release and, uh, um, and clearance of goods. And then finally, um, measures which um, uh, focus on the freedom of transit, uh, which help to facilitate the movement of goods uh, across borders. Uh, this is particularly particularly important to landlocked countries uh, of which it, there are 16 alone in, in Africa. Um, now, in the context of the African continental free trade area, um, which of course came after the TFA, the WTO TFA, um, contains in the protocol on trading goods, um, three relevant annexes. Uh, so we have uh, the first annex on customs cooperation and mutual administrative uh, assistance. Um, and then the second is really the main, I guess, annex with all of the different measures that relates to the simplification and harmonization uh, of trade procedures and logistics to expedite importation, exportation and transit, et cetera. And then finally, the annex, uh, annex eight, which deals with transit. Um, and you know, comparing both the TFA and the, the different uh, annexes in the, in the protocol uh, uh, on, on trading goods in the FCFTA, one can really see that it, it pretty much mirrors the, the WTO's trade facilitation agreement. So most of the measures 
uh, in, in the EFCFTA really reflect those that came in the uh, WTO's uh, uh, trade facilitation agreement. Now, if we kind of try and, and, and consider and take a look at really which uh, measures really benefit African traders uh, and are maybe most important or say relevant to the proper functioning of the special economic zones, um, I mean, one frankly can say that overall the 36 measures are very be beneficial. Uh, but based on a lot of research that have been conducted um, on uh, the impact on export performance and the lowering of trade costs, um, the first measures that really have the, the greatest impact, uh, uh, the, the first relate to those, um, again, uh, with uh, the, that impact the transparency that I had mentioned earlier. So the availability of information and transparency is paramount to traders. Uh, such as publication uh, of trade-related information, uh, especially on the internet. Uh, what exactly are the import and export requirements and procedures? Those are really key to uh, uh, African traders. Uh, and with that, for example, is setting up an inquiry point uh, for traders uh, that they can uh, contact and get the relevant information they need on a specific import or, or uh, export uh, uh, transaction or procedure. Um, second, a second uh, area of um, of measures uh, uh, globally is really related to the expedited customs clearance procedures and proper risk management uh, systems. Um, now, for special economic zones, um, you know, equally important to to having affordable utilities, road, rail, and port access is really ensuring that um, uh, SEZ exporters have access to effic efficient soft uh, infrastructure uh, to, to help them facilitate trade, primarily the customs clearance, uh, having a full-fledged risk management system in customs administration. Uh, administrations are really key um, to help speed the release and clearance of goods, uh, to put in place uh, procedures such as a pre-arrival processing and post-clearance uh, audit systems. Um, thirdly is uh, what we call border agency coordination. Now, um, a lot of African traders um, they, they, they have to deal with a lot of cumbersome trade logistics, border control formalities, uh, lengthy border crossing procedures. Um, and as you know, I mean, trade transactions do not just concern customs administrations, uh, but there are many other agencies at the border, whether it's health, agriculture, standards, uh, standards port authorities. Um, and, and there needs to be proper coordination among these, uh, these agencies at the border uh, on the national level to help really expedite the release and, and, and clearance process uh, of goods. Uh, the same is also uh, needed uh, when we talk about cross-border uh, trade. Uh, and it's also important in the case of SEZs where we have uh, different zones that, that share the border between African countries. So things like coordinating um, uh, working hours, harmonizing procedures and formalities, all of those are really uh, important. And then finally, uh, one of the most, let's say, uh, ambitious of the trade facilitation measures and, and really uh, most considered to be quite costly to implement is that of the single window uh, in the context of trade facilitation and not to be confused with the one-stop shop or you know, sometimes single windows for investment. But here it's a really focused on uh, trade facilitation and in particular expediting the release and clearance of goods. Um, and in order to have a single window, one of the basic uh, prerequisite requirements is the uh, border agency uh, coordination. Um, so instead of having one, uh, you know, to have to go to different uh, agencies individually, they are grouped together um, where uh, you know, one a trader would go there once, uh, uh, and then the the documentation gets disseminated to all of the relevant agencies, uh, and then there would be sort of a a, a a feedback that comes in again once. So uh, it, this really re reduces clearance time uh, greatly, and it also could be uh, uh, developed uh, on an electronic 
basis or even on regional uh, level between uh, countries. So just quickly, because you know, uh, given the, the time uh, uh, allocation, um, in, when we look at the status of implementation of the trade facilitation agreement in, in Africa, uh, now, you know, four years on, where do we stand? As I mentioned, there are 41 African countries who have ratified. Uh, most of them did notify their implementation commitments uh, to the WTO. Um, yet the implementation rate of African countries in general is um, rather, let's say, um, low in the sense that um, a lot of the, the, the measures that I've mentioned uh, earlier that are really key uh, for uh, facilitating trade, um, they are um, the implementation dates for these measures uh, are something in the between 2030 to 2035. So of course the agreement gives this uh, ability for each country to, de to designate its implementation commitments based on its, um, its capabilities uh, and also in requesting technical assistance and capacity building uh, before implementation. Uh, but it's important to, to highlight that if the, the continent, you know, at this stage, uh, is really uh, looking towards uh, um, integrating, uh, you know, great with greater integration uh, under the AFCFTA. Um, then, you know, country, African countries need to look at this uh, more in depth and and to realize that, um, you know, the sooner these measures are implemented, really the better uh, the uh, the the benefits will um, will uh, come. Uh, to uh, to Africa. Um, now, just finally, uh, before I close, I, I wanted to mention some of the challenges of facing uh, African countries for implementing some of these measures. Uh, we find that uh, different studies and, and, and according to the World Bank, there are really no countries starting from scratch. Um, you know, much donor support has already been provided or is in the pipeline for trade facilitation reforms. And I attest to this from even before the agreement, uh, there's been a lot of technical assistance and financial assistance going to African countries. And what we do kind of uh, uh, see is that a lot of these measures, uh, uh, you know, you know, require what we call uh, soft assistance, uh, like raising awareness, updating legislation, uh, and updating trade and customs procedures. Um, which, you know, in a sense, might not need a lot of financial assistance to actually uh, be implemented. Um, also, some of the implementation challenges that really cannot be resolved with technical assistance and capacity building, um, you know, um, relates to having a lot of competition between government agencies. I've personally seen this firsthand between customs uh, administrations and trade ministries in the area of trade facilitation. Um, sometimes we see a poor a public and private par uh, partnerships. Uh, so between the, the government ent uh, entities and the private sector, um, the lack of coordination between agencies on the national and regional levels, and finally, the lack of really sustained political will uh, and the commitment to change. And um, these are just some of the, the issues which I think need to be tackled um, as, you know, Africa, you know, really it, it needs the champions, as, as we say, uh, in order to get the Africa that, that we want. So um, anyways, I'll stop here and I look forward to, to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mena, for those contributions. You've reminded us about the importance of trade facilitation and the overall promotion of a more competitive, more efficient business, commercial and trade environment on the continent. Your reference to transparency is particularly important. This, of course, requires access to information. You're absolutely right. This may not necessarily need enormous financial resources, but the political will to put information in the public domain, which is particularly important. The importance of the good governance principles, transparency, accountability, and the availability of remedies should a problem arise, of course, fundamental to also eliminating the non-tariff barriers, many of which are associated with customs border management and other trade facilitation issues. Thank you so much for your contribution. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we now have, <clears throat> excuse me, a video contribution from the OECD. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Amelia to come back. Unfortunately, she will have to leave us shortly. And um, Amelia, your final remarks, having also listened to the contribution of your other panelists, thank you so much. We appreciate your doing this before you leave us. Over to thank you. you. Thank you so much, and thank you to all for uh, the very coherent set of uh, presentations and, and recommendations. And I think all the issues raised, I don't want to repeat. I just want to take a step back and go back to the importance of investment. And investment not only on sector specific or industry specific uh, priorities, but investment in general in resilience and sustainability, because that will shape the priorities of government and field and firms to build back better. We cannot, I mean, we have to think now that we are in a recovery post uh, shock phase that we don't know yet how long it's going to last because the, the impact on productive sectors, including those where, as you said, operate. So uh, these have to cover issues from focus on infrastructure sectors key for productive capacity, but also including investment on physical, digital, and green infrastructure, areas where we see, as I said, including, as I said, in Africa, making important strides. So an important push for supply chain resilience uh, is another message that I want to, to leave with, with the panel, not only from the viewpoint of the m and and firms, as Andrew said, but also from the sector in general. How can we build resilience that include network restructuring, the, the relationship uh, along the value chain, location decisions, investment decisions, supply chain management solutions, and, and try to, to, to think about sustainability measures for the sector. So for me, this is very important to, to bring to the debate because we, the continental free trade area give us an opportunity for more collaboration and more cooperation regionally, but also help us to think about a framework to cooperate regionally going forward. And again, we should not forget about a coherent policy approach and a strategic level approach uh, from a sector perspective to, bring, to build resilience and also from a country perspective. Uh, as you said, uh, through the, 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 the region is very fragmented in terms of um, of uh, agreements and negotiations, but a lot can be done in the context of, of this current opportunity that the continental free trade area uh, provides. Finally, um, I would like to remind the, the goal should be to ensure that sustainable recovery is inclusive. So the issues of social labor and, and gender are important and also that it, uh, it benefits and extend to all countries in the region and to all partners. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amelia, for those parting words. We will recall them again when we wrap up the session. We wish you all the best as you move on to your other commitments. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now able to share the video. Farah, thank you so much for doing that. This is a contribution, ladies and gentlemen, from Mike Fister. He is the senior advisor at the OECD, and he's going to take a look at collaboration opportunities, taking a look at the AFCFDA, SEZs and the other regional economic communities on the continent. Thank you so much for sharing, Farah. Good afternoon. Good morning uh, to all distinguished participants. Um, first of all, a very uh, warm thank you to the organizers um, for inviting uh, me to speak on what I think is an extremely important and exciting topic, um, particularly how the African trading bloc and its relationship with other trading blocks can help special economic zones and vice versa. Our special economic zones can help now to the African trading bloc in this um, in this regard. Now, I would say the future is, uh, is relatively exciting, uh, and this is particularly against the backdrop of the recently signed uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement, and particularly what it entails for special economic zones. Um, of course, we're still in the middle of a, pan of a global pandemic. The economic crisis that has resulted from the pandemic, in addition to the health crisis, is still very present in many parts, uh, many parts of the world. So we have to see how we all come to grips uh, with the crisis before, to, before we can make any concrete 
forecasts or even um, even uh, tangible strategies, if you will. However, um, the pol uh, the political uh, foundations for um, I would say a promising future on the African Trading Block has been uh, um, have been set, um, and even before the uh, even be uh, really before the pandemic, the African Trading Block has been one full of uh, full of potential. Of course, intra uh, intra regionally, um, there's a lot of uh, I'll say room that is still still to be conquered, and it needed this uh, type of uh, uh, agreement to uh, uh, to boost and to make it to the next level, particularly if you want to compare it. Uh, the inter, inter regional trade with other parts of the world, such as in Southeast Asia, for example. Um, but, uh, but also um, in terms of the African trading blocks, trading relationships with other parts of the world. And there I would like to, again, just um, make the link to Southeast Asia. Um, I think between 1990 and 2012, uh, trading between the ASEAN region, if you will, and the African trading block has increased on an average of 14% per year. Which is uh, um, which is remarkable. So there's a lot of potential. There's a growing trading, uh, a growing trading link, which would be very interesting to to observe uh, after the pandemic, of course, but also as, as the African free, uh, the, the uh, African continental free trade agreement um, then basically um, uh, is being implemented and is being finalized, if you will, in many uh, uh, in many ways. So what is it, um, or what is in it for special economic zones, if you will? Um, I think, first of all, there is a fundamental issue that would st still needs a bit of clarification. There are some voices out there that uh, claim that special economic zones should be not considered in the uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement because companies within SEZs in Africa already do benefit from preferential treatments. Um, I think, Special economic zones are central to the success of the African continental free trade agreement. And there is in particular, I would say, three elements uh, that need to be considered uh, um, for special economic zones to basically uh, to, to, to reap the full benefits of special economic zones. So in a way, despite the, the, the great political uh, breakthrough, if you will, of getting the African continental free trade agreement off the blocks, it is, you have to go back to the fundamentals as well when it comes to special economic zones. Governments have to do their own work. In many ways, it's the small pieces of the puzzle that make the puzzle fit together, right? So um, fundamentals of special economic zones development still apply and maybe apply even more than before because you want to make sure that um, the overall African trade, trade block benefits from, uh, from the existence of special economic zones as an instrument to reach a sustainable development objective through your industrial policies. So one of the first things to, uh, to consider is that special economic zones can, of course, be established to attract investment for your own sustainable development objectives. And we're talking foreign direct investment, but also domestic investment that needs a special boost uh, to, to, reach, uh, to, to reach some uh, uh, sustainable development objectives. Secondly, governments have to put all the efforts into supporting the development of the enterprise, the, the enterprises around special economic zones. So targeted uh, small and medium sized and SME support measures for small, for domestic small and medium sized enterprises to be able to cater into uh, the special economic zones to become partners for companies in the special economic zones, thereby you creating the much wanted and much needed linkages Right uh, between special economic zones and the surrounding uh, economies, so the special economic zones will not end up being economic enclaves, as often being criticized for. Now, um, and for this, there's also a third element that needs to be uh, that, that, that that needs to be considered, and that is the integration of technical and training institutions within the vicinity of the special economic. Sometimes even in the special economic zones, but also around the special economic zones, so, they, so that they can provide, um, so that they can provide uh, the training and other services to the enterprises um, that are that are catering to the special economic zone to be able to upgrade the overall, uh, I would say, industrial 
uh, an industrial ecosystem. And as such, you know, special economic zones are very, very important for the success of the African continental free trade agreement, particularly if you get SSOs right. And I think the big picture now uh, is actually provides an extra boost for governments to get SEZs, uh, SEZs right, because SEZs can really provide the winds into the sails of the African free, uh, the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, and boost intra-African trade, but also um, Africa's trading with other parts of the world. Having said that, thank you very much for your attention, and I do hope that these points um, serve as um, food, food for thought and provide you some insights. Thank you very much. And again, it's a shame that we cannot be together physically, but hopefully this was an effective medium to get some key messages across as well. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, on your behalf, I'm very pleased to thank Mike for his contribution. And we can all probably echo his wish for us to meet in person in the near future COVID permitting. We really do miss those personal interactions and sharing of information and experiences. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my great pleasure to welcome Mubarak Lowe. He joins us from Senegal. He's the Director General of the Senegalese Economic Prospective Office and is also an honorary member of ISO. Mubarak, it's a great pleasure to welcome you now to share your thoughts. And we're looking at Obviously, SEZs have become a major policy instrument for all and hopefully um, many more African countries that have not yet implemented the SEZs. But what would you say are the key factors for SEZs to succeed, to contribute to industrial development, diversification, and also to contribute to the broader sustainable economic development objectives? that are articulated in the AFC FDA and in every national development strategy for all countries on the continent. You have 10 minutes, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Puri, for giving me the floor. Uh, as you know, uh, the Special Economic Zone were adopted relatively late in Africa and most African countries do not uh, did not operate their programs until the 90s and the, or the uh, 2000s. At, as of 2020, there are about 189 operating SEZ in Africa and five, uh, 57 SEZ projects have been announced for completion. And SEZ are well developed across the continent and are present in 47 of the 54 countries. Uh, since their inception, the special economic zones have been a significant boost to foreign direct investment flows in Africa, have created attractive investment condition and supported job creation. Over the past five years, 60 million jobs have been created in agro processing, industrial fields, and services. African economic zone have also led to export diversification, promoting regional trade and stimulating industrial spillover effect and clustering. In many African countries, export growth increased rapidly after an SEZ program was introduced. For example, when Gabon opened an economic zone in 2014, national exports increased at eight times the following year. Some countries such as Morocco and Ethiopia are explicitly pursuing an SEZ driven strategy to fuel their trade growth and implement high value generating companies operating in textile, automotive, aeronautics and electronics sectors, not to mention leather. For Ethiopia is very important, Lisa. Hence, SEZs are increasingly playing a key role in supporting Africa's industrial transformation and economic growth. For policymakers, institutional investors, and international financial institutions, it is crucial that economic zone performance is accelerated. Special economic zones are one of the main devices 
to advance the objective of the African continental free trade area in, driven, in driving sustainable economic growth, uplifting trade integration, enhancing competitiveness and promoting industrial investment, as well as job creation. The, uh, the AFC FTA agreement supports the establishment of an operation of FEZ, as mentioned by Mr. Shamba, uh, for the purpose of accelerating its development. SEZ can accordingly be viewed as part of the strategic instrument to accelerate Africa's industrialization that will create employment and economic diversification, which will embrace everyone, the private and public sector, women, yours, and many more. The AFC FTA is also a business opportunity and a remarkable achievement that would help African economic zones to expand their activities and develop new processes supporting the vision of creating one African market under the IFC FTA agreement. To this aim, African member states are expected to pool resources to take advantage of the economics of scale factor and the comparative advantage when designing economic zone project. The IFC FTA is yet to develop the regulation which will govern SEZ, as mentioned by uh, the sec executive secretary. The negotiation for rule of origin in respect of goods produced in SEZ are still ongoing and are yet to be concluded. Goods produced within SEZ are subject to the FT uh, IFC FTA rules of origin and can be freely traded under the agreement according to the original drafting of Article 9 of Annex 2 of on rules of origin. However, some member states expressed some concern regarding this provision, alleging unfair competition deriving from tax and other investment incentive granted to companies located in economic zones. They also consider firms established in SEZ as not being truly African, which is very bizarre, as they perceive them mostly foreign owners. Hence, they are suspected do, to not particularly benefit the local economy with backward or inward linkage. Therefore, such member states argue that products originating from SCZ should not benefit from the IFC FTA. Contrary wise, excluding economic zone from the IFC FTA can have undesirable effects because of the following. First, economic zones have evolved nowadays and many companies call it export processing firms could benefit from similar incentive schemes without being physically located inside the economic zone. Many countries have what they call a free point enterprise. So they are not in special economic zone, but they can accede uh, to all the benefits uh, given to the enterprise located inside the export processing zone. This makes the task of determining SEZ and identifying identifying firms that receive benefits usually associated with the economic zone, very tricky and difficult. Excluding goods produced in the economic zones may reduce the effectiveness and efficiency of the IFC FTA, as it would exclude sizable shares of intra-African trade from the, school, the scope of the continental agreement. If you take Ethiopia today, if you say that Ethiopia cannot use of its SEZ to export to Africa, I think uh, this will create a real problem for Ethiopia to benefit from the IFC FTA. The tax incentive provided to firms in economic zone may not necessarily allow them to reduce cost of production because you have logistic costs, uh, you have sometimes labor costs, you have uh, cost to access uh, power, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, unfair competition is not demonstrated. On the other hand, no exclusive treatment is applied to goods originating from SEZ in the large majority of African regional economic communities. In the ACP Cotonou uh, agreement, in COMESA, 
in the Economic Community of Central African State, in SADC, Southern African Development Community, and also in the three-party free trade area. Only ECOWAS uh, considers SEZ uh, uh, as a foreign uh, zone, if I can say, and apply uh, custom to the goods for uh, uh, originated from this, this STZ. The same treatment can be observed in the economic partnership agreement with Europe, as well as the African Growth and Opportunity Act with the United States of America that has no explicit provision for product originating in SEZ. African member states can build upon what is already taking place in most of Rex and allow the FFC FTA to trade in goods manufactured in SEZ. It is to be highlighted that under the existing EPAs and AGOA provision, goods originating in SEZ located in Africa, AU and US can freely trade among these markets under respectively EPAs and AGOA. Consequently, if goods originating in economic zones are excluded from IFC FTA, this would result in discrimination since the same product, when originating according to the, the respective agreement, can be freely traded from African economic zones to European Union and United States and vice versa, but not to neighboring African states under the IFC FTA. Furthermore, SEZ based in the EU, uh, European Union, could trade originating product to those African uh, Union member states that have si signed the EPAs, while product originating in SEZ located in the EU member state that have signed EPAs would not be able to trade originating product to their African EPA partners under AFC FTA. Accordingly, it would be more convenient to locate production and investment in Europe rather than in Africa. This is very uh, bizarre and counterproductive if you want to advance the AFC FTA agenda. Such inequitable treatment would work as a disincentive to invest in SEZ for export to the AFC FTA market. And this is in exact contradiction with the AFC FTA objective. In conclusion, the unfair competition from subsidized goods is also treated under all the appropriate instruments, such as the WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. Additionally, the Article 2 of IFC FTA Annex 2 and Annex 9 on trade remedies make an explicit reference to the WTO ISCM. Such provision may eventually be amplified to reflect such concern. The experience of all the FTA in dealing with the WTO ISCM may also be further considered and studied to reflect similar concern. The situation of uncertainty related to the treatment of original nating goods in SEZ may really have profound implication on the decision making of firms willing to invest in SEZ located in the African continent for manufacturing and job creation. Therefore, special economic zones are to be accepted and utilized fully for the purpose of triggering economic political policy reforms that are focused on accelerated diversification at the production and export levels. In this respect, as the African Continental Free Trade Area, IFC, FTA, is yet to develop the regulation. African Economic Zone Organization uh, should be supported in its, uh, in its uh, fight uh, to, and, uh, to, to advance this agenda of uh, making SEZ fully uh, inside uh, the facilities given to African countries to export to neighboring countries. And thank you very much for listening to me. Mubarak, thank you so much for that excellent contribution. You reminded us again of the complexities of international trade governance in the 21st century. And some of those complexities as they pertain to SEZs 
not only in the context of the AFCFTA, but of course, other international trade agreements, including the WTO. How those decisions are made at the individual firm or enterprise level to locate their businesses in various SEZs is going to be extremely important, as we've heard from many of our contributions this morning to the success of the African continental free trade area. But you've also reminded us that in order for the AFCFDA to succeed, we need to support improvements in governance more generally, but also to address some of those challenges that we face related to access to, for example, energy security to water and other incredibly important inputs for all sectors that we want to develop across the, the African continent. So the SEZ within the broader national, regional, continental context is particularly important for us. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been checking with Farah to ask if she has any questions in the chat room. And while we have a lot of complimentary feedback for all of our presenters, we don't have any questions. In the absence of that, and in the interests of time, what I would like to do is to ask each one of our presenters who has now had the opportunity to listen to colleagues on, on various issues related to SEZs and the AFC FDA to make a final remark. And um, I'm going to do it in the order, Willie Andrew Mena Mubarak, and Ahmed, then I'll come to you. I do see on my screen that Dr. Samir Hamruni may well be with us. If he is, then I will ask him to make some concluding remarks. So Willie, may I start with you? You have one minute for your final wrap up. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Trudy. Uh, I think uh, what I can say to emphasize is uh, what has come up is there has been a mention that regulations for the operation of special economic zones will be developed. And these regulations will have a bearing on the rules of origin. So what I would wish to encourage is uh, for authorities responsible for special economic zones to ensure that you give your input to your chief negotiators as they will be negotiating these regulations. Because these regulations must be approved by the Council of Ministers. And because of that, you are a key stakeholder, the SEZ authorities in various countries, and even at continental level. You are a key stakeholder. And I would wish to encourage you to participate to participate. The negotiations, as you are aware, are between countries. They are amongst countries. So, but each country has got a chief negotiator. So what you need is to make sure that in each of your countries, you have given your input to your chief negotiator and you are appropriately represented and your input is taken care of. Because the output, the regulations will govern how SEZ will operate. And remember as well, this will have a bearing on the rules of origin. So the opportunity is there for your input to be had. I thank you. Thank you so much, Willie, for that reminder of how important engagement at national level is for these negotiations to succeed. Andrew, if I may turn to you now for your final remark. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Trudy. Um, yes, it's an interesting discussion. Um, there are certainly quite a lot of implications there. I think some lessons can be learned from the way the European Union has dealt with free zones within its, its uh, customs union area. Um, the AFCFT is not a customs union yet, of course, but the ambition is there to be a customs union. And I think for consistency state and coherence sake, actually it's important that the continent moves quite rapidly towards the customs union, um, actually. Um, but the European Union has some rules and regarding the treatment of exports from its export processing zones. So if they export outside the European Union, they still have the duty free um, privileges. And if they export within the European Union, then they may have to pay some additional tariffs and the like. 
as I said, for us, it's a little bit more complicated because we're not a single customs union yet. But I think there's lessons to be learned from experience elsewhere where there's been regional trading blocks and export processes. Thank you so much, Andrew. Mina, if I may turn to you now for your concluding remarks. Yes, thank you very much, Trudy. Uh, indeed, this has been a very interesting uh, discussion and listening to the different uh, panelists today and their relevant expertise. I just wanted to say that in the area of uh, special economic zones, as you may know, um, we don't have a legal framework in the World Trade Organization which governs uh, the functioning of special economic zones. Uh, we do kind of um, discuss them in, on, in different agreements. Uh, and in this respect, I think given the importance of the rules of origin uh, that is coming up in the, uh, this phase of the AFCFTA, uh, then I would really encourage uh, different African administrations, but also the different, um, you know, whether it's the AFCFTA Secretariat or the African Union, those really involved with the, the negotiations currently to also um, uh, sort of reach out to the WTO Secretariat, as we do have obviously an agreement on rules of origin, uh, one which caters to preferential rules of origin, but also non-preferential rules of origin. But in this respect, we have expertise in this area that I think at this stage one could uh, sort of uh, reach reach out to. So um, I think this is what I can sort of pitch in at this stage uh, of the discussion. And again, thanks again for uh, this great uh, uh, opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mina. And of course, the trade facilitation agreement also has a facility that um, yes. we could certainly take more advantage of. Yes, absolutely. Th thanks for the promotion. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Mina. We now turn to Mubarak for your concluding remarks. Thank you so much. Well, I hope that uh, within the, the next six months, uh, before the end of the year, an agreement will be reached between African countries on this subject. Uh, and I hope that it will be a consensus, all African countries supporting the integration of the SEZ within the framework of the IFC FTA, uh, because the SEZ companies could be uh, quick win, uh, could, could serve as quick win uh, initiative because they are already ready to export. So uh, if you want to launch this IFC FTA successfully and very quickly, I think we should use these enterprises as key queen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mubarak. Ahmed, may I turn to you for your concluding remarks? Thank you so much. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you to all panelists for this uh, insightful debates and for this uh, fruitful discussions. We, we really appreciate your contributions and uh, we we, we believe that the African economic zones today can benefit from the support of all of its partners. Uh, and with regards to the implementation of the CFTA, that becomes one of the major challenge that we are addressing today. Uh, I think that uh, the economic zones community within the continent uh, are entitled to develop uh, new processes to support the implementation of this agreement, uh, to support uh, regional integrations to, su to support the industrial upgrading and, of course, the development of, uh, let's say, a continental uh, uh, complementarity in the value chain. So these are major topics where economic zones can play a key role uh, in advancing the objective uh, of, this, uh, of the CFTA. And uh, definitely it's a window of time, as I mentioned earlier, for the economic zones today to develop a new strategic approach uh, considering the regional markets of Africa and considering its, poten its, poten its potential that would lead, of course, to enhance the attractiveness of our zones. And that would lead, of course, to attract new FDIs to, 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 to our community. Uh, thanks again to all our partners. And we believe that together we, 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 could be, uh, we could be stronger in advocating for the benefit of the development of economic zones across the continent. Thank you so much, Ahmed. 
Dr. Samir, I'm so pleased that you are with us to make your final remarks. If I may hand over to you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm really sorry for not having attended the entire uh, uh, um, webinar, but um, perhaps my words will bring me back to the introduction of uh, Ahmed. Um, three, four years ago, we make uh, we started a project called it the Free Zone of the Future. And you name it, free zone, economic zone, special economic zone, it doesn't matter. We ask it ourselves how a free zone will look like in 25 years. And instead of making it in 25 years, make it less, let's make it shorter. Uh, we reached the conclusion that a successful free zone or economic zone is the one that is contributing to the local prosperity. A free zone is, or our regime, is a global initiative for local prosperity. We can contribute to increasing trade, we can contribute to creating jobs, we can contribute to attracting investment. But let's not forget that we base our attractiveness in certain privileges and in certain incentives and in certain element that we give to the investors. And the only way to succeed is that the return on investment are not just for the investment or for the economic zones authority, is also for the society. As Ahmed said, an economic zone is a place for knowledge and for technology. We need to be able to share that knowledge a free zone and economic zone should be safe for good, for money, for intellectual property, and for people. A free zone should be tech ready. We need to be, we need to lead the digitalization. Much more important than attracting investors, it is to link these investors to the local society, to the local population through entrepreneurship. 75% of the free zones, companies are small and medium enterprises. If we want to succeed, if we want to create more jobs, if we want, if we want, if we want, we have to take care of the small and medium enterprises. Sustainability is the future. We have to be good with the environment and we have to be friendly with the environment. A free zone should be a good place to work and a job of quality for the free zone authority and for the investor and should have its social corporate responsibility program. This is what we understand from the out, um, African Economic Zone Authority organization, the World Vision Organization, and all our members, how a free zone should look like in the future. And this is the best way to directly increase our contribution to this huge project, huge challenging project, call it uh, Africa, free trade continental area. Not only contributing to the trade, not only contributing to increasing our contribution to the economy, but assuring the local prosperity of the people surrounding us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Samir, for that important reminder that neither an SEZ nor the AFC FDA is an end in itself. There is a much bigger development objective that we are striving for together. It remains now, ladies and gentlemen, for me to thank all of our panelists, to thank Ahmed and the AZO team, Farah, Samir, and others who have very ably assisted at this morning. Dr. Samir Hamruni, thank you so much for joining us again at the end. And to all our panelists, Ladies and gentlemen, those of you who have joined us either live in the Zoom platform or via the streaming service, thank you so much for your contribution and your encouraging remarks. This has been a particularly important discussion, but this is not the end of the discussion on AFC, FDA and SEZs. There are important governance issues that are still in the making as we've heard, but there is an important development dimension, which as Dr. Samir and Ahmed have reminded us, focuses also on longer term development issues, sustainability, trade and gender, 
job creation, addressing the fundamental challenges that every African country battles with. The AFC, AFC FTA cannot achieve it on its own, neither can ACZs, but it is the complementary nature of all of these initiatives and also all the support initiatives that we see developing around the AFC FTA, the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, support for industrial development, quality assurance development, all of these will create a more efficient, more effective, more development supporting environment in which decisions to invest, trade, to produce goods and services will add up to more jobs, more sustainable income opportunities, and the improvement of the welfare of the citizens of all African countries. I thank you so much for joining all of us, and we look forward to meeting again for further discussions on these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ahmed, alf shukr.